Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining our museum webinar today. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, I mean, this uh, this problem that uh, occurred just now, uh, but think these things happen in the digital sphere. Uh, my name is Maria Papayuanu. I'm the arts manager of the British Council in Greece. Uh, this webinar, the museum as uh, an innovator, a platform space and catalyst for social and cultural development uh, with uh, creative consultant Tom Fleming and co-founder of co-museum and curator Sofia Hanvaka uh, is part of a series of museum web chats we plan to organize uh, in the context of the museum work we do in Greece uh, with our museum professionals network and uh, co-museum. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Co Museum is the International Museum Conference. We have been organizing in partnership with the US Embassy uh, and the Benaki Museum for the last nine years uh, in Athens and in Thessaloniki, uh, fostering the exchange of ideas uh, and the facilitation of networks between culture and arts professionals from all over the world. Um, back in March, we were planning this discussion as an open event at the Benaki Museum here in Athens. Um, COVID-19 has completely changed the way we work, the way we interact, the way we think. Uh, digital can be challenging for most of us, but and by no means it can replace the face-to-face -face activity. But something that we have been discussing with uh, our colleagues and partners is that it has given us the opportunity to connect in a more open and democratic way and to attract a very diverse and very international audience. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, today participants from Spain, from Germany, from Poland and the UK uh, and of course Greece uh, who are here with us uh, today. Uh, before we kick off, uh, please allow me to remind you some basic house rules. Uh, remain on mute and keep your video off during the session. Um, we would ask you to type your questions in the chat box, uh, but please remember to state your name and the organization. This webinar will be recorded. It has already started um, uh, being re recorded and shared through our museum platform and our co-museum platform and through all our communication channels at a later date. And uh, in case you face any technical issues, please let us know in the chat box or email my colleague Katarina Galani at the British Council. Um, I think it's time to begin. Uh, Sophia, Tom, thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Maria. I, I was going to start by saying how wonderful it is with the digital means that we can all come together as a community, but I'm going to save my words for later because I think many people will not even be able to join. And in fact, that's something to keep in mind always when we think about the digital as a democratic space. Uh, anyway, uh, my name is Sofia Handaka. I'm curator of World Cultures at the Benaki Museum and I'm the co-founder and uh, host of the Co-Museum Conference that we've been organizing with the British Council and the US Embassy in the past uh, 10 years. I'm very happy and very proud to be hosting this session. It's a live example of how we can combine forces to serve our communities, which are becoming one community. So the Museum Professionals Network from the academies of the British Council and the Co-Museum community that are becoming stronger and stronger. And how we can also bring in closer uh, professionals and people from around the world. As Maria said, we have people from Romania, from Spain, from the UK. So I'm very happy to be here uh, to be hosting uh, Dr. Tom Fleming, a leading international expert on the creative economy, cultural and arts policy and creative cities and regions. A few words about Tom, a few because he's done a lot. Tom's work focuses on advising governments, municipalities and institutions across the world to develop effective research, policy, strategy and action across the creative economy. He has led strategic research projects in every region with a particularly strong track record in Europe, Russia, South Asia, the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. He set up in 2002 Tom Fleming Creative Consultancy, which he leads together with an interdisciplinary and multilingual team to deliver multiple projects across the world. Tom is also an expert advisor to UNESCO in their program to support the 2005 Convention on Diversity of Cultural Expression, and he's an established communicator and convincer. Last but not least, Tom is chair of the board for Sight Gallery in Sheffield and is a trustee of Arts for All in London and Arts Cabinet in Edinburgh and London. 
Now, Tom is an expert in placemaking as he's in a, in a believer in culture centered development. And this is something I would assume we all believe in. And right now we are offered the opportunity to prove how important the role culture can play in development and in well being and place culture at the center of our recovery strategies around the world. And museums could be very easily and helpfully be part of this uh, building back better recovery, as we call it. So we're very privileged to engage in this discussion regarding the very nature of museums as change makers. Because yes, maybe museums are mainly considered or were considered as safeguarding memories of the past. But what about thinking of them as makers of the future? A museum is not anymore just a collection or a building, as I heard recently in another discussion, but it is a social process, an interrogative space where change can happen. So let us enjoy Tom in his presentation, and soon after that, we'll have a fruitful, hopefully, discussion. The title of his presentation is The Museum as an Innovator, a Platform, Space and Catalyst for Social and Cultural Development. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you. Many thanks, many thanks. And it's a real pleasure to join you today as well. Um, and thanks for the rather humbling introduction. It, uh, it's, uh, it, it actually sort of fills me with a little bit of fear because like everybody, I've just been sitting at home um, for the last few months. And it seems like a distant memory, a lot of the activities we've been involved in. But of course, that's slightly changing now. And, and we're all looking forward at some point, hopefully in the future, be able to be able to meet and connect in person in addition to the digital. And it is that balance, I guess, between the digital and the physical that is the future when it comes to how we understand the role of the sector and of museums context. Um, now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and ambitiously put some slides up. Good. So um, my, my provocation really today is to think around the role that museums have in uh, as this hybrid space space being physical obviously and digital but also space being something that connects the past to the future and museums as, as a catalyst an innovator a converger of different types of content different types of experience obviously using different types of technology to open up conversations regarding who we are as a society regarding our our, our memory but also our changing fluid sense of identity and place and to situate the museum at the heart of a bigger discussion of, of how culture as a whole can help us to reframe society as we rebuild trust, as we develop new types of social contracts, as, we, as, and as a way of underpinning that, we generate new types of knowledge, new types of agency going forward. I'm going to try to be optimistic through this and not to dwell on the, obviously, the shattering um, uh, and, and in, in many ways still unknown impacts of the COVID pandemic um, and instead to think about how the museum can play a positive and progressive role in the future, in a future where everything of course is different and the opportunity is that we are in a position to be able to reframe, to co-create that difference rather than just respond to it um, and, and, and wait for other sectors, other parts of society to, to refine, redefine who we are and where we're going. This is an image of Site Gallery, which was mentioned, which I'm the chair of, which is a, a, a small to medium sized contemporary art museum in the city of Sheffield, which is just um, last year, or 18 months ago, had a capital rebuild and days of real optimism in terms of how a building based organisation can play a transformational role in, in a city and how it can help to generate new trajectories of identity and place for that city going forward. And everything was different on that day when that building reopened um, three times bigger than it was before. But of course, today it's a very different kind of different. And I'm gonna explore what that means a little bit in the next few minutes. Um, and of course, we also heard about the digital just now and, and digital um, often being positioned as the, um, the opposite to the physical. And of course, many organizations, institutions and, and working across the cultural sector are recognizing that there's a fluidity between the digital and the physical. And we're working in a much more convergent space. This is site galleries, uh, uh, play on words really, in terms of how we've digitalized a lot of the archives. We've generated lots of content online. We've also tried to curate it. So it isn't just this binge of content, but instead it's something that's, that is, is hopefully tempered toward changing demand, giving people uh, a, a level of content, new types of narrative that access 
the wider footprint of the organization and its networks, its social capital, its people, its ideas without overloading. And getting that balance right seems to be key for institutions as they try to retain a level of noise and visibility and therefore relevance in a context where people haven't been able to physically go to the museum. And, and many museums, obviously, particularly larger ones, were already investing heavily in digital. You know, this is the National Gallery in Singapore, for example. They were already looking at the pervasiveness of their footprint and how they can extend far beyond the physical walls. Uh, this is a smaller museum, the John Stone Museum, which has been playing, uh, as a, playing a role as a real innovator in the last few months in terms of digital tours of the museum. So you can go there, obviously, without leaving your home, standard digital tools. But what we need to move toward, I think, is, is, is a much more considered hybrid um, con construct for a museum. And this is my, almost my position statement, here, which is that museums are at a crossroad between their analog past and their cross-platform future between their local communities and global realities, between their unique specialisms and a set of transversal agendas linked to community, place, environment, education, health and well-being. And this is the, the, the new landscape, and perhaps it's always been the landscape museum, but a crisis, technological change. And as I will go on to talk about, the, a, a sense of uh, shared strategic um, uh, dilemmas or issues that are becoming global or if they weren't already and then this is creating a real sense of of opportunity for the museum to play a fulsome role as the as the connect of the convener of conversations the generator of new types of knowledge with a sense of social responsibility and a, and, and a need um, to become that space of trust where trust is eroding in other parts of society particularly trust in relation to the people and the government's that are emotionally elected to serve them. So museums can become that open platform. Um, and there are five kind of ways that um, I want to just describe the way that museums can create this new value proposition in a wider cultural landscape, in the sense of the city and civilization, really. Uh, and I'll go full circle here, uh, and because these are all various ways of saying something quite similar. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that I'd like to see or to think about museums as a kind of social technology. They are a device. They are something that was designed in a different age to deliver a certain set of outcomes. Uh, that, those outcomes were about knowledge, about development, um, about notions of civilization. Uh, they were uh, around notions of civil society, um, the notions around ownership of the knowledge, uh, the codification of knowledge. Uh, and that obviously is changing and changing in new and exciting and often challenging ways. Uh, and museums are broadly adapting and innovating, sometimes responding to change. Good ones, the best ones, um, often collaboratively are driving change and increasingly recognizing their role as a social enabler, as opposed to broadly part of a cultural or even wider entertainment um, landscape, a leisure um, provider. And that social role, I think, is something that we're seeing more and more of um, and building the relevance of a museum, opening up its surface area, wider publics, but also creating depth and opportunities for, for, for engagement in the content, the ideas, the, 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 the incredibly complex things that are sitting often beneath the, the collections in a museum. Um, obviously, platforms like Museum Crush, which can, opens up the idea of a museum as this kind of vector of knowledge with real breadth, depth and diversity, are helping us to understand how museums are themselves a social technology. Um, in the UK, the National Holocaust Centre works as part of a digital R&D programme, which set about recording and creating, in a sense, holograms of Holocaust survivors so they could continue to tell the story in person after they physically, unfortunately, died, because obviously so Holocaust survivors are, uh, are old now. Um, so using emergent technology to create depth that enables future stories to, to be told. Um, we Are Museums in the, in, in the US talks about the need for a museum to open up, to, go, to become an inside out institution, to become a platform that drives innovation through, as, a, as a stage for collaboration is interdisciplinary and cross sector, bringing avid, engaged communities together with the museum having responsibility to widen its shoulders, to become that connector, that vector. And even quite you know, large scale uh, museums known for their architecture, known for their, their physical regeneration impact, to 
which is the Museum of Modern Art here in Medellin in Colombia, are looking at how they can more subtly and, uh, and, and socially open up their assets, their knowledge base, whether it be through you know, creative classes, drawing schools with harder to reach communities. Um, obviously, lots of museums, I think, think of themselves now spaces for making, for production, for imagination, for creation. Um, maker spaces are in every museum of any size now almost, and obviously at the heart of the, uh, the museum offer for children and young people, such as in, in, in the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh in the USA. Um, and museums are therefore becoming this much more kind of curated convergence space. Um, and when it comes to questions around innovation, sustainability, uh, and driving change as opposed to responding change, museums are, uh, are, are seek, seeking to create new narratives based on different platforms, different kinds of content, different types of products and services, which create a holistic overall experience, which can be personalized depending on the type of audience that you are, and in turn can help to generate income streams across a diversity of sources. But more importantly, make, make the museum uh, a, a kind of multi um opportunity for society to engage in their in their needs around aspiration around identity and the, the importance of social connection. So the Maltese cultural um, expert Sandro de Bono talks about the museum as, as a convergence platform. He and he talks about the Harry Potter um, um, uh, franchise as an example of that. So from, a, from an idea, you have a book, you have a film, you have products, you have services, you have experiences, you even have theme parks further down the line. And even the smallest museums can think about how they can unpack their assets to have that kind of um, almost smorgasbord of products, services and experiences. Um, at the heart of this is the idea of, an, of a museum as a hub, but also a museum as an amplifier of the aspirations, the needs, the identities of a are increasingly diverse set of communities in a city, in a city that's globally connected. And this is, there are some, fa some fundamental value propositions here. The notion of a museum as a safe space, as a convener, as a connector, and, and also as a broadcaster of meanings and values. And museums are becoming increasingly sophisticated in the way they understand that amplification role. Uh, it, in the early days of, I guess, of social media and, and of smartphones, it was it was a more simplistic sense of creating a kind of echo effect of the museum. Again, users to interact um, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of more, more straightforward linear map fashion. But now we're moving much more towards the, the open contestation of the meaning of the, of the content. We're moving much more to a, a, a process of dialogue and co-creation. So thinking through how social media much more than an amplifier, it becomes a set of feedback loops that inform the very essence of what the museum is all about. Um, but this is a physical proposition as well. This is the Factory uh, Contemporary Arts uh, Museum in um, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, which I think very interestingly um, in its mission statement talks of itself as a factory of critical ideas, a site of constant physical transformation, a network of people who just who strive to think about tangible and intangible cultural memories that, ma that matter and are indelibly unique. Um, and the notion about being interdisciplinary, about being critical, and this notion of process, conceiving our journey into the 21st century, that is the role of a hub. Um, that is, it, it, for me, the idea of a museum as a process rather than a physical entity that is in stasis. Um, and there are different ways of understanding this, of course, opening up penetrating the physical walls of the museum, creating critical voices, being, being fluid in the way that the collections are interpreted. So museum hack does that with you know, alternative tours of museums at different times of the day for different audiences. Uh, so it links to a third point, which is that notion of the museum as a physical catalyst within the spaces of the city, as, as something that asks questions about what is in place or out of place, how the city is changing, who is it for, where is it going? Game changes for city identity. Uh, now, often the narrative here is one of regeneration, of the the, the transformation of physical space through culture, uh, and that's that's uh, you know the, the, a classic tool used by many cities. And obviously, the most exuberant of them, or one of the most exuberant examples, is here is the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. The notion that you can change a city through cultural infrastructure, but actually there are much more fine grain 
and, sen- and, and, and subtle and challenging notions around the mu- role of museum in urban space or as a placemaker. This is the Museum of Street Art, or part of the programming of the Museum of Street Art in Amsterdam, which looks at, uh, looks at the city and its public spaces as part of the collections of the museum, that commissions in public space outside of the walls of the museum. So it becomes this catalyst beyond its physical location, asking questions about who the city is for, um, notions around public space, around safety, around identity. Um, back to Site Gallery, the m- museum that I mentioned at the top of the conversation, we are opposite a piece of unloved public space, uh, a, a, a small kind of pocket square or, or park in the, in, on, on the edge lands of the city centre in Sheffield. And we've taken it on as a responsibility of ourselves really, but also an opportunity to help to catalyse change in that public space, to open up the square to different users, become, uh, become that agency that can ask questions around notions of ownership, uh, notions of 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 of, of mobility um, and and critically notions of public and private in in public space. So we have a commissioned program. We have an, a, a, a something called Art in the City, which is a critical review process, thinking around how the city can change through art, culture, creativity, community engagement, using the space as a symbol and a process within that kind of criti- process of critical dialogue. Um, and I guess. The COVID crisis requires us to be more open than ever. It requires us to think civically far more than institutionally and to work together in ways that can help to ensure that the city itself doesn't lose its sense of relevance, doesn't fragment, because of course every city now is incredibly fragile. Um, the, F- the Financial Times had a big piece recently around North American cities and how if their cultural infrastructure is allowed to erode, if it isn't able to walk, work civically uh, and connect different sectors, different communities, then that might in, se- in, a, it might in itself um, open up the floodgates for people to leave the city, particularly the notional creative class who engage with these cultural institutions. But also it will create to, it, it will impact on wider processes of, so processes of social po- polarization um, between communities. So we have an opportunity to connect because people need to be connected. And we have a responsibility to connect communities who would otherwise be disconnected, marginalized, lost from the narrative as, of, regarding the city and where it's going. So com- this comes with, therefore, with a process of building museums as responsible custodians for the city or society, for strategic agendas that are important for human survival, let alone um, the cohesion of communities. Uh, And of course, many museums do see themselves as um, responsible custodians of the past, segue moving into the future. The whole movement around the decolonization of museums collections points to that. The importance of problematizing the narratives that perhaps we've always taken for granted and deconstructing critically the collections through engagement with different audiences, different communities and different issues. Uh, and this is becoming mainstreamed in the very fabric of curation and museum management um, uh, and increasingly so given some of the crises we've seen, um, not, not least in terms of who owns the museum, who owns the narrative of the past and who can create the narrative of the future. And you know, Organisations or businesses like Snapchat have been, have been engaged in this, you know, in creating digital um, platforms in relation to things like Black History Month, British Museum with their LGBTQ guided tours, creating different understandings of the collections, critical arts at the heart of the museum offer. And this only works if museums are able to generate trust. And this is where I think there's a huge opportunity for museums of any size today. Populations are yearning for a sense of trust, predicated on a sense of connection and mutual understanding. Uh, The COVID crisis that has so disconnected us in many ways has also affirmed the need for culture, for engagement, um, and to build those spaces where we can feel as one, um, where we can connect in ways that, I guess, um, reassure us of our shared humanity. And museums have a incredibly important role to play there. Um, and they need to think very deeply, all museums need to very, very, think very deeply about their response.
responsibility in that context. There's a lot of critical responses to the, the, the way that some museums perhaps glibly responded to the Blackout Tuesday um, uh, uh, agenda for, for Black Lives Matter, for example. Um, whereas there are other museums that recognize we are in an important moment in history in so many different ways and responded positively in terms of the way that they di di they're diversifying their collections, the way that they're building content to reflect the times we're in. Um, some of these responses have been around, again, that arc around digital and physical, opening up at a time where things are closed, ensuring that museums are there for us and will become income more so there for us in the future. Um, some of them have recognised that they have a, a, a civic responsibility to champion the communities who are, 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 are most disadvantaged by, through this crisis. And this is the Round Museum in Exeter in southwest England, which has this, had this campaign around lockdown legends over the last few months. Um, the people who are connecting the increasingly um, uh, fragmented pieces of our cities, of our societies. Some museums in both the public and private sector have used this as a moment to reach out to talent from diverse backgrounds to ensure that there's this pipeline of new voices coming into the space, both physical and digital, of the museum. Um, and some, though, have been hamstrung by the practicalities, the technology of opening a, a physical space in a time of pandemic. Um, and th these are creating all sorts of infrastructural challenges, as we know, which have cost implications and absorb lots of labour, lots of energy, lots of thinking. Um, but they also open up new ways of thinking around the museum as a whole. The role that it has to tell that story that connects the past to the future. The role that the museum has as this vector for transformation in an urban environment. Um, and this is where I want to finish, really, just with an, one example, uh, a very small example from Japan, from the Borderless Art Museum, or NOMA. And a recent programme they've had, uh, actually I think it's an ongoing programme, is called CoLab. And it's, it's a very straightforward um, process of, of co-commissioning with other institutions, artists from different backgrounds, um, to symbolise the importance of the museum being an a borderless proposition. So it's an interdisciplinary cross art form exhibition that co-locates artists of different cultures, different art forms, different sensibilities in the museum. And it builds the links between them as human creatives. And it therefore makes a symbolic point about the importance that the museum is a connector, a vector, a, a, a social technology that is increasingly borderless. And it's borderlessness that will define its future possibility in terms of being something that is at the heart of the way that we reconstruct our cities and our society over the next generation. Um, so that is my little provocation for this morning's or this afternoon for some of you's discussion. Okay, so I will stop and hopefully we can have a good discussion now. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much, Tom. There are so many issues that you put in a 15 minute presentation that I don't know where to start from. Uh, for sure, in the way I see it, the, all these different, they're not new, but newly discussed, uh, let's say, characteristics of a museum as a hub, as an amplifier, as a social technology, new words, they are, but they have to do with building trust. And building trust is something that's especially now we need again practically as well in a sense for museums to do so building trust with people with visitors with physical visitors to come back but building trust also in their position uh, in the recovery let's say of our societies so this is one big issue that uh, i see in your discussion and then it's the next step which is uh, equivalent step is, is the role and the position, the place of the museum in the city, the whole of society, not just inside the walls, but what it does with the communities and how this trust is built by being part, like almost like a service of the city, you know, in the same way that you have bus stops, you know, I'm making too flat as a suggestion, but in this sense, so the museum is part of the city. And we should not forget that. We should not forget that as museum people, we should not forget that as uh, citizens as well. 
And this would be the big challenge for museums to get people to see, for, to see their visitors, to, to see them as safe spaces. Um, so these are for me the two issues that uh, we could discuss, plus the very, very difference that the digital world made to our lives in the past three weeks, three months. And this is especially with respect to the use of social media. And that's what I would like you to maybe tell us a few words. You, you said at one point we need to think through social media. Uh, it's my feeling that the very beginning, all museums just put online what they had. So they tried to just move the physical into the digital. Soon we realized that in order to keep this relationship and this interaction, we should use and think through the social media, not just use them as facades of what people are missing because they cannot uh, visit the museums. So would you would you give us more uh, on on how to do that, more examples maybe on how to do that uh, more effectively and more quickly, because that's one other issue, how to quickly respond to situations. Mm -hmm. that, that's my question. Sorry, I haven't even checked if there are questions in the chat. Maybe I should. <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a connected um, point um, from Dina here as well, I think, which actually I, I'd like to start by reflecting on an important element there, which is that, of course, not all museums have the same digital capacity and not all museums have the same digital connectivity for a start. Um, and th there's, you know, th there is a significant leap between being a small museum where every member of staff almost has a, a, a role in terms of managing content and sharing the, I guess often people see it as the burden of the social media element, as opposed to larger museums that have people whose job is to manage that content. Uh, um, what, what, I, what I suggest is that the most interesting museums are those that see the digital and the social media arc of the digital not as a promotional platform per se, although of course they have that role, but, but what they provide is a different level of depth and uh, access to a greater level of diversity from within the organisation and its connections um, uh, and its collections. Um, but the, the key um, thing for me, the key strength for, you know, for museums that have really strong digital me media, social media offers, is that they see, the, see that as an amplification of their audiences, as uh, something that really brings the conversation visibly into the pub into public space from the, their users, their communities, um, their uh, critical friends. Uh, so some museums, for example, have been commissioning things like podcasts, which of course there are, there are millions of podcasts these days, but they're doing that sometimes to bring into the space of the museum, the digital space of the museum, voices from elsewhere, outside of the team, outside of the immediate family of the museum. And this is where museums see themselves as that hub, that convener. Uh, and I, I, I'll um, give you an example going um, back to the site gallery um, reference because we talked long and hard about how in this COVID crisis we use digital not just as a way of bringing people into the museum that they can no, can no longer visit but actually as a platform for discussion and debate about culture in the city and, as, and in addition to that We've been working with cultural institutions across the city, other museums, much, some of them much larger, and um, the festival sector, the university sector, uh, to coordinate content as well and to have shared events and shared discussions um, and, in, and to signpost to things that are being broadcast by different cultural institutions. So there's almost a, a channel for culture and content that is a collective endeavour um, across the city. So there's something around uh, opening up and diversifying the, the, the conversation. Uh, there's something around it, the digital enabling you to be more civic in the way that those conversations go. And there's also something around how you get that balance between promoting what you're doing and actually talking more broadly about the around culture, identity, place, whatever it may be. Um, and, and this is something that is 
incredibly hard to achieve and get the balance right. The, the, the temptation is always just to deluge people with, with, with content, whereas it needs to be more subtle and considered than that, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And also, uh, I mean, I'm interested in the way you see things in your profile, let's say, because you, you, you're also an advocate of the position of culture in development and also thinking always of the development of a city, not only financial, but social and uh, the whole uh, picture of how culture and museums, their role can play. How do you think this can uh, now that we've been through the uh, period where uh, for sure it has proved that culture has uh, helped a lot of people and uh, supported the well-being of a lot of people. How do you think we can make an argument now towards uh, museums playing a leading role uh, in this discussion also in order to be able to to basically finance their recoveries as well? So do, do you get my question? How How can we put museums yeah. more in the discussion and in the game of, of convincing governments even to, to, to bring forth uh, funds for the recovery and for them supporting the citizens? Okay, well, in, in some ways we've been there before, but not in such straightened times of crisis, um, because the cultural sector, of course, has always had to fight for investment and only a very few governments have prioritised cultural infrastructure uh, for its own sake, but or even for a, a, a wider set of outcomes. You know, broadly, that instrumentalisation argument around how culture can deliver on social good and economic development and cohesion and education and things like that. But those arguments are still there, but now they're more profound than ever. Uh, and I, I think there are perhaps two answers to this. Uh, one is the importance of demonstration. And I think museums are starting to very actively demonstrate their value. And as they open up, and they're the first bits of the cultural infrastructure landscape to open up, they can show their importance as those safe spaces. They can demonstrate the way that they are building trust and satisfying a yearning for connection, for, for knowledge, for, for, for the notion of the civic as well. And, and the second is the importance of partnership. And this is, you know, we often get very bored and uh, you know, quickly exhausted trying to manufacture new partnerships. But museums, like never before, can play a role in the in the pastoral care of our communities as they get back on their feet. And that links obviously into health and wellbeing agendas. Uh, it links into community cohesion. And um, it also links into um, some of those wider systemic issues around things like racism and environmental change. And museums can I think like never before show that they are this critical axis in society. They're so vital for the, for the, the healthy fabric of society to, to, to survive and then and flourish. Uh, as to how you articulate that to governments, which are often motivated by prejudices rather than ready for enlightenment, that's another thing altogether, uh, which is why it's important that museums work together with other parts of the strategic landscape, the health providers, the universities, the education system, because they will have the voice before the museums, because we've seen that in the past. Uh, just a, a, a word of caution, though, um, more broadly, is that in a culture for development context, museums, particularly in, you know, I guess you might call it broadly the global south, tend to be smaller, tend to be you know, really poorly resourced. There are as you all know, there are massive issues in terms of capacity. Uh, there are all sorts of issues in terms of just retaining collections, let alone having that development role. And in many parts of the world, museums are, um, are less able to play that development role than things like this, the festival sector, which can be more mobile and hasn't got those kind of capital costs and things like that. So that, that's a slightly different set of 
um, I guess, strategic challenges in, in, in those kinds of environments. Um, and finally, so just going back to, to the case making, there's, I think, has to be a stronger kind of, kind of collegiate culture between museums of different scales uh, working together in terms of their strategic case making and positioning. The first museums to open up in most places are the larger museums. How can they articulate the value proposition of the whole museum ecosystem to governments as they start to show the importance of museums to society as a whole? And I think that shared sense of responsibility is really key. It's not just for the large museums to own the strategic narrative. Great, thank you. And in fact, this is something we're trying to do with the Com Museum as well, bring museums together from all around Greece and bring people together into making a strong case uh, as a body, as a whole. Uh, I have a question here by Dina Diora. It says, given that due to COVID crisis, we're moving more and more towards a heavily digital era, as we were saying before, how could we make sure museums today reach out to the more vulnerable communities? Let's not forget that not everyone has access to the internet. We experienced this this morning. And the online world is not the only answer to those new challenges. So how can we reach the more vulnerable communities and those that are not uh, digital friendly? Um, that's a really important question. And, and it's obviously much harder to uh, for a museum to actively respond to that challenge in a time of social distancing and a time in, and a, also a time of the erosion perhaps of of trust in the, you know, the outsider we're all more nervous now perhaps than we were a few months ago uh, some museums have you know, many museums have you know got really really brilliant you know i guess what used to be called outreach programs and you know that involves working with schools with healthcare providers um, it involves working in partnership across the cultural sector that there are all sorts of you know, models. I, I used a slide earlier on from Glasgow and you know, the, 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 you know, bringing the museum into different settings, bringing the collections as an interpretive tools to build com conversations, break down boundaries. Um, and that needs to be done like never before. You know, some museums even have you know, things like mobile collections in minibuses and you know, st standard analog technological solutions are still really important in a context of digital divide, but also in a context of reduced physical mobility, even within cities. And that physical mobility is because of social distancing, also because of the, of the economic and social impacts we're only now just beginning to see where people will otherwise be more locked into their community, their physical communities. Uh, so if museums are to play that role, not just a sticking plaster in the city, but actually as enablers of um, community cohesion and um, co-creators of a wider, more ambitious sense of the civic and of, of, the, of, of the shared of a shared future, then they need to work in partnership with their users, their communities, their audiences in that blend of physical spaces across multiple settings of indoors and outdoors, in healthcare settings, in retail environments, in working with um, partners in things like sports and, and the wider leisure landscape because they're also obviously ultimately in competition for people's attention and their time and their energy and their ambition. Museums can't do that alone, they need to work in partnership. Yeah, very much so and as you were saying also bring people from the communities in to discuss and plan and co-create this kind of uh, outreach or general uh, engagement uh, programs. I have another question by Marlene Mulio. Uh, my concern is about the crossroads museums in the UK right now. Brexit and COVID-19 may be two factors that will impact museums into the way they approach diverse communities. What are your predictions? Will museums in the UK focus more on inclusion and social justice choices or turn more introvert or end customer-oriented? Uh, um, yeah, the Brexit question as well. God, I, just, just to make our days feel even more miserable. Um, I, I feel that museums are, are 
different museums will, will go in different directions here. Uh, we're seeing the active internationalization of some museums. Arguably, you could say it's a little bit late for some museums, but we're seeing even some smaller museums developing international strategies as a response to the walls going up of Brexit. Um, partly that's because they recognise that intrinsically they were always quite international and you know, benefited from being part of a wider scene where there's knowledge exchange in a sense of collegiate um, shared opportunity um, and that being obviously threatened hugely by, by Brexit, not just in terms of funding, but just in terms of mobility um, and, and um, that's, that's a huge threat to the museum sector in the UK. And obviously it's not great for museum sector in Europe either, but particularly for the UK. So some museums have, are actively seeking um, to cement um, sustainable partnerships with museums that will last and withstand whatever the shock of, of Brexit brings. Um, whereas other museums are closing in on themselves a little bit, um, without naming names, I think that there is a sense of go local. And COVID actually is weirdly ex extending that in that, you know, it's, it's demonstrated that, um, you know, we need to reflect on things like, you know, our environmental footprint. Or, um, we need to understand that museums as, a, as, a, as an attract attraction factor, that factor for cultural tourism will only be sustainable in a landscape where we are all tourists now even if that means walking around the block to your local museum, you're in a sense a, a kind of cultural tourist in your own city. So they're becoming more, much more dependent on building um, trust and engagement with local audiences who they want to be able to have as repeat visitors um, and or people who can in invest in different ways digitally through programming for a whole range of things so that they can sustain their, their business model and their relevance through local engagement. Um, the smart action, of course, is to bring those two things together and be international and local at the same time and recognise that those two things are mutually, um, mutually interdependent as opposed to different trajectories. Uh, as to my predictions, I don't know. I, I'm, I try to be positive and think that you know, every challenge opens up a disruption effect which requires museums to be innovative and to generate new ways of working. They always have done. But uh, at the moment, I think there's a lot of um, museums that aren't quite sure which way to jump. I, I think for everybody working in museums, small or larger in Greece or abroad, it's this difficult, it's not a conflict, but this, this angst of survival right now and what will be the next day. All around the world we see museums closing down or maybe not reopening. So this angst of being resilient and uh, sustain oneself and then this equal angst or, or, or tendency and uh, need to give to give out and this is a discussion i've heard before as well and i would like your opinion uh, museums have given out a lot online a lot of digital content material discussions whatever you say it and it has been free this is not sustainable so I was wondering if you have an opinion of how this could be capitalized upon in the future for museums to be able, and I'm not talking about specific things, but generally how to capitalize on, on, this, on this digital analog continuum that we have now without becoming a business. Um, well, in, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's the extent to which being enterprising equates to being a business and museums have to be more enterprising than ever before and you could if you if you were thinking of it on those lines you could see the kind of you know for the pastoral care that universe that uh, museums are providing at the moment to communities through things like creative packs and art packs and you know reaching out to audiences as well as creating you know, digital channels which they hope are locking in existing and creating new audiences. These are these are audience development tactics that hopefully um, will generate um, downstream a level of new types of income generation. That income generation 
you might be able to be you might be able to monetize it through audiences but audiences will have less ability to pay so so it has to be something that you can monetize through public investment or through public mm -hmm. public private partnership uh, and this is where it's easier again for the larger museums because they can build up relationships with retailers they can build up relationships with broadcasters and and um and uh, a whole range of different platforms that have access to resources for the smaller museums that's where it's much tougher uh, and th this is where there's going to be much more of an uh, emphasis on philanthropy on small acts of kindness through crowdfunding um, on sponsorship and on finding ways to co-deliver services that deliver public value um, for a public sector that's increasingly stretched and this is where the great unknown is because obviously we're going to see all types of challenges on, on public investment going forward um, so I don't know whether it's that it's, it's that clear-cut thing between being commercialized versus being um, some, something that's driven by uh, a not-for-profit mentality but we all need to be I think more entrepreneurial in the way that we conceptualize of a museum's business model going forward because there will otherwise be more casualties than than um, the sector can fundamentally bear. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I have a, another question by Dina, which kind of argues something different. She says that small independent organizations like independent galleries, community centers, small collectives have proven to be extremely resilient and resourceful when it comes to overcoming economic and social hardship. I wonder what key lessons could museums learn? Let's just say take a leaf out of the book of those smaller organizations in recovery times post-COVID. So what key lessons we can learn from much smaller and I guess more flexible um, organizations? Um, I, I think there's one, one response is a cultural one and one response is a, a, a kind of management or use of, or space model or, um, idea. So the first is the cultural one, which is that community centres, collectives, the sense of the sort of DIY, the grassroots, that they have built into their DNA a culture of openness and inclusion. And uh, they are um, neutral in terms of who they're for in many instances. They have a generosity um, built into their into their um, identity. And that means that that open door policy brings in a sense of warmth and enables them to generate revenue from hires, enables them to generate a, a, a proposition for public sector partners as, as service providers. Um, and, their, and their overheads are much lower than your average museum because their curatorial model is one of um, open the doors um, and, and, mm -hmm. in, and connect as opposed to fashion something that is much more complex. Uh, but I think there is absolutely something to be said for that, particularly as in this recovery phase, as we rebuild trust as we open up, that museums should you know, very much see themselves as community centres, those hybrid intercultural spaces of generosity and civic purpose. Um, the second um, element, though, I think is, is around how museums also need to be somewhere that transforms you or, trans or provides a sense of transformation. And aspiration quality and this is i'm not saying this is um something that community centers or the community sector more broadly doesn't do or the independent galleries as dina says in her question as well but i think it's sometimes harder to get that balance right um, particularly for the larger museums and galleries because one of the part of their attraction appeal is that people go there for transformation for, for a sense of enlightenment the sense that this is is, is going to it's, going to, it's nutritional in, in, in ways that are harder to achieve in your neighbourhood. Um, and that's why they become mega attractions for tourism. Um, and historically, these museums have, you know, they've recognised that they're competing for time and resources from audiences that might otherwise be going to the shopping mall or might be going to the cinema or, or, or wherever else. So they've got to have that customer care, that service, that architecture, that technology. That, that competes with that um, and that 
that sometimes denudes the institution of the sort of more visceral warmth that you have in a community setting. So that's a much harder thing to achieve. How do you design in a community setting into larger, shinier cultural institutions like national museums, for example? I guess that that would be a very nice uh, synergy, as you were saying before, bringing in the people who know how to do it better. So even collaborate or work together with smaller community centers or such uh, cultural institutions, DIY citizen initiatives. And then, and I guess this kind of wraps up as well what we started saying, then the, the, the museum is really part of the city and it has built the trust for people to even informally feel it as their own. And I guess the rest can come. You have to always build the strategy behind it and have a plan, but co-creating and co-curating exhibition and all these core words that we're using sometimes in theory to really want to engage our public could become true by just opening up your door as a first step and saying, OK, let's get together and see what we want to do. Exactly, and this is where the notion of a museum is as having this opportunity now to become this space of, of, of shared of sharing of trust of to be that safe mm -hmm. space I mean it's so important because we need it yeah and discussing issues like uh, poverty like uh, the Black Lives Matter everything that is important for the society on the spot on the moment and live the day well, Tom, it's one o'clock already here in Greece. I just realized this is all the time. And uh, I think I will have to give you a big thank. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the organizers. Maria, maybe do you want to have a say? Well, I just wanted to thank both of you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sophia, for your valuable insights. I think that was only the beginning of a really fruitful conversation. Hopefully, Tom will have you with us at the museum conference, at the co-museum conference in December, either December or February. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, register, please register to our co museum newsletter so as to find out more uh, about the next uh, web discussions that we plan to organize. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think we stimulated, I think we had a really nice and very stimulating discussion. And Tom, you gave us a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, enjoy the rest of the day, stay safe. And uh, hope to see you again in one of our future uh, websites.